So talk about digital transformation. Kamti Baboke in New York, Matsati Ratzmi in Tel Aviv. So I'm not sure if that's A R V R L L or whatever, but clearly it's digital transformation. So what I want to talk about is a little bit about what I think drives technology in the in the most real way, and maybe some lessons just for the future for the things that people are thinking about, things that people are developing. I don't look at digital first. I don't look at mobile first. I don't think about anything other than people first. People first. Always start with people. If you start with people, it gets you to a different place. So when I talk about it, it's advertising defined by tech or enabled by it. I don't think we are defined by technology. I think that we take technology and we use it to define the world. So we're enabled by it. So let me take you through some good examples. One of the keys is this, like, let's get back to doing what we do best business that's marketing. And when you think about it, print was a technology. Print was an amazing technology. Radio was an amazing technology. I mean, think about it. You sat in your living room and all of a sudden voices came at you from some box from no place. That was amazing technology. Television was the same thing. All of a sudden you sit there and people are talking. You're watching them. You're not just listening to them. These were all technologies and we forget that. We somehow think that they weren't technologies, that we've only created technology in the world that we're living in. So in the next 15 minutes, I want to talk about some outlooks and implications. Some of these came from the, I write a lot for LinkedIn. Some of these came from my seven predictions for this year, which I'm very proud of already. Four have come to fruition. I'm going to talk about those. What I think is a new, tech, new focus for innovators. And then fine, if nothing else, remember nothing else I say, I'm going to leave you with two little thoughts. So let's start with the outlooks. So, We've always used in our business algorithms and programmatic buying when we talked about media. This is not new. We just didn't know they were called algorithms. So probably we'll be a lot richer if we understood that what we were doing were, were algorithmic. But here's the problem. We always had control. But thinking not people first, we let control go. And so we let everything become programmatic. Everything was driven by an algorithm. So what happens is that my industry starts to suffer because all of a sudden, the ads that we care about, the things that you care about, the things that you don't want to see next to things that we find to be repulsive start to hurt the industry until finally, Kristen Lemke, the CMO from J.P. Morgan Chase, who happens to be my client, takes the first big stand and says, wait a second, enough. 400,000 sites, 400,000 separate content sites are being bought every day by my programmatic and we're stopping it. We're going to come to 5,000 we pick. Now, 5,000 is a big number too, but think about that, from 400,000 to 5,000. You know what the biggest problem was? Nothing. Zero degradation of their message. So we went from 400,000 to 5,000 with zero degradation. And those 5,000 were picked. Those 5,000 became things that, in fact, people were in charge of. So let's follow that up, because fake news, it just came from the New York Times. Fake news is a major issue. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue in the world. Some people think that it caused an election here in the United States, almost caused one in France. But here's the problem, right? We don't understand enough about fake news, because, in fact, Social media is just as much fake news as what you might read in Breitbart, or if you're on the other side, maybe you think the New York Times is fake news, it makes no difference. Or if it just comes from those fake news farms out in all over Eastern Europe. But we just saw this happen, right? We're seeing celebrities, or I consider them faux celebrities, getting paid tons and tons of money to pretend that they like something, to pretend they're going someplace, and think about all the business that it drives. That, my friends, is fake news, no less than anything else. So what's the implication? The implication is what just happened now with the fire Festival. This was terrible. Hundreds and hundreds of people stuck for thousands upon thousands of dollars, all because of fake news. Make no mistake. So that's the first implication. The second implication is that we've become vulnerable because we have lost our ability to do due diligence. We've lost our ability to think. We don't think anymore. We see something online, we see some celebrity say something, we all think, wow, that's the greatest thing I ever saw. I can't wait to do it. And look what happened to these people. Had anybody done the slightest due diligence, they would have found out that, in fact, that the organizers of this so-called festival had done this once before, and it failed. All it required was one little click, and they would have discovered this. 
And yet they were so bought into this fake news that they weren't able to. So we're vulnerable. It's not just that we're vulnerable to vote for the wrong person or to make the wrong choices in business or in what we purchase, but in fact, we're making choices like this that are terrible. The third one is that there is a potential here, and this is huge. There is a potential for news sources to grow in importance. So what we found in research, people want a trusted news source. They want places that they can believe in. They want people that they can believe in. Now, this isn't new, but it's new again in our age. And so what happens is the New York Times adds 41,000 subscriptions in a week. Since then, they have added over 500,000 new subscriptions simply because people are looking for new news sources. They don't believe necessarily what they see on Facebook or what they get or what you and I might share because they don't know where the source is anymore. So people are getting a little bit smarter, but sadly not smart enough. So let's talk about micro-targeting. You've all heard about micro-targeting. There are businesses around micro-targeting, and some of them have sold for actually hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And yet, look what's happening. Facebook is now talking not about micro-targeting, but about broader targeting. Because in fact, what happens is, when you micro-target to micro, you create an echo chamber. And that echo chamber gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you're talking to one or two people. And your product goes away, your sales go away, your ability to be anything big goes away. So even Facebook is looking out and saying, this is the wrong thing. And what's interesting about this quote from the Financial Times, and you can all go Google or Bing it. I always say Bing because Microsoft is a client, so I have to say Bing at least once a presentation. But if you go and search it, what you'll find out that going back to almost 2010, the Financial Times wrote about Facebook and called it TV-like in its ability to reach broad audiences. And of course, all the analysts said, no, 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 this is about micro-targeting. But Facebook has come back then and said, no, 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 that's not really what we're about because that doesn't really drive business. I'm not clicking. There we go. So let's look at the implications. The implications are that brands need to rethink their strategies. So this is Mark Pritchard, who is the CMO of P&G. He's one of the most powerful people in our industry. We targeted too much and we went too narrow. Think about that. It doesn't mean that targeting is wrong. Let's be clear. It doesn't mean that digital data is wrong. On the contrary, I'm a huge believer in it. I've spent my life in it. What it means is that when we use it for what I call digibabble, when we use it and we ascribe to it powers that don't exist, we're making huge mistakes. So let's move on and look at where else this goes to. This is all in a flow. Media accountability. Who is accountable for what's happening in the world today? Who is accountable for fake news? Who's accountable for the hatred? that gets put across? Who's accountable for the terrorism that gets developed online? These are terrible things. Now, the truth is, and those who follow my writing know that I'm a very big believer in this. I don't believe that Facebook can be held accountable for fake news. And by the way, they don't believe that AI is going to solve the problem. They don't believe that it can because the implication of it, the ability to actually understand what's the motivation, what's the contextual point of any news is way too difficult. It's just not going to happen, which is why they have just hired 3,000 extra people. So they have 7,000 people working 24 hours a day to try to track down the hatred and the news sources that they can't go any other way. So this is from the former president of the United States, who saw this a long time ago, that this was a major problem. But let's look at what the implications are. So the implication, as I said, is who actually owns this. So Facebook has stepped up a bit. Google is pretending to. Others are trying to. The fact is, you and I own this. Because the only way we're going to solve this problem is, in fact, if we start educating younger people how to act online, how to understand what's true, how to read, how to write, how to follow sources, and make those critical decisions. I refer you to, and you can all write this down, and Google this afterwards, the Waldorf schools, very important, very, very important Waldorf schools that don't allow their children to use computers. Now, I thought they must be Mennonites or something, you know, Amish from the backcountry who don't, who don't believe in technology. Turns out the single most powerful and largest and most important of all the Waldorf schools is where? Silicon Valley. And who goes there? The children of the elite of Google and Facebook. Now, why is that? So they asked one of the Google executives, 
why would you send your kid to a school that doesn't allow them to use computers? And he said, I'll tell you why, it's really simple. We've made computers so simple that they'll learn how to use computers in a minute. That's not the issue. The issue is, will they learn to think? So my movie scenario, and it's trademark, by the way, so not anybody copy it, is that Google sends all their kids there. We send all our kids to the schools that are only using computers. One day, Google pulls all the power in the world, and no more computers, they run the world. So there you go. TV will continue to grow importance. This, I think, is really critical. Um, Television, don't think about television narrowly, and I'll talk about that in a second. But television is the single most important thing going on in our world today. And if you define it too narrowly, that's absolutely digibabble. Television doesn't mean what you watch and broadcast. That's nonsense. It's basically watching content. Because whatever you watch, whether you're watching something that you streamed, something that you saved, something that you bought, something that somebody shared with you, it makes no difference. That is all TV. Make no mistake. The only question is, who pays for it? And I think that Linda Iaccarino, who talked about this this week, is making the absolute right point here. Because the truth is, without advertising, most of that stuff is going to end up going away, and we're not going to want that to happen. So my bet is that we're going to see a completely new model of aggregation of content that will be some kind of a combination of advertising and payment and subscription, something different than we have today, but I guarantee you it's going to look a lot like cable television. Let's talk about experiences for a second. I love experiences because it would seem, if you read the press, that we never had experiences in our life until somebody discovered digital. Now, the truth is we know that's not true, but what's really interesting is that experiences, actual live stuff, is out of control. People want to go to restaurants. People want to go buy things. They want to go to Broadway shows. They want to go to movies. They want to go to sports events. This is true. This is amazing. And I have to tell you, having been in Israel, during Pesach, and I went to Maccabi Tel Aviv versus Hapoel, was unbelievable. Let me tell you that Madison Square Garden is not that exciting, without a doubt. Now, those kind of live experiences, you cannot, you just can't. Anything digitally immersive is not even close to that. So here's the interesting thing. Let's take a look at what Facebook is doing. So Facebook, who owns Oculus, is not even talking about that. What they talk about is AR. Why? Because they can take AR into the real world. So they love that. They love the ability to be able to use their platform, but bring it into the real world and start bringing those things together. So it's not about sitting in your living room. Imagine having 10 of your friends over for coffee and everybody's got on you know, a VR headset and you're kind of talking. It's kind of stupid and, and ridiculous. It's not going to happen. But AR has huge implications, huge opportunities for connecting the real world with our digital world in ways that we haven't thought about yet, in ways that I think are important. So quickly, I think that innovators need a new word. We need a new focus. We need a new way to think. So I love this. The Silicon Valley buzzword disruption has the aftertaste of a sucked battery. It doesn't mean anything anymore. So what do I believe in? I believe in dissidence. And dissidence is about creating movements. Dissidence is about challenging the doctrine, challenging what exists, but uniting people for a common cause, uniting them for something, creating a movement. I think that's a way bigger idea. And it's about having a vision to change the world. So let me give you a couple of examples. I love this from Pampers. Pampers partners with UNICEF. This is going on for 10 years. It works because it drives business for Pampers, not only because they want to be a great business. So those two things are OK to happen. You buy a pack of Pampers, is a vaccine for a child in, a, in the developing world. Like, what a great idea. And what mother doesn't want that? That is vision. That is people first. Here's another one. The video viral, everybody saw that, of the guy on United who got beat up and then thrown off the, the plane, sadly. If you notice, he was Asian. That went nuts in Asia. It was crazy. People went all over it. And the joke is that it was all about people first. That's what talked to them, because they saw themselves in that. It wasn't because of technology. It wasn't because it was just social. It's because they saw it. One hashtag on one website drove this. 20 million views an hour. That's absolutely nuts. Let's talk about a movement. I love this one. I, I, everybody from Israel has to go look at this. This is a new crowdsourcing nuptial act. It's called Rate the Rabbinate. This is how you can go to the Rabbanut and you can say if you like this rabbi or not. There's been a lot written about it the past week. It is fabulous. It's published by Itim, something I happen to be on the board of, so I give you full uh, disclosure there. But you must read it. It is unbelievable. 
And this is the kind of thing to me, it's not going to be a huge business, it's not going to be, but it's the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. And finally, I'm sure you've all seen this, Cafe Cafe, if you come in and say, Toda Raba, so you get like a discount on your coffee. Like what a big marketing idea that is. Not necessarily digital, but freaking brilliant. And that, I think, is what's going to change the world. So when you think about disruption, think that disruption is all about inward thinking. It's all about yourself. Disruption is, is schwitzing. It's saying, I'm a disruptor. I'm great. Dissidence is looking outwards. It's looking to people. It's looking to the audience. It's how do you create a movement. It's how do I bring people together. It's how do I create something different. So if nothing else, and I'm done, Steve Jobs, one of my heroes, technology is nothing. What's important is that you have faith in people, that they're basically good and smart. And if you give them the tools, i.e. the technology, they'll do wonderful things with them. And I do believe that this is what distinguishes Israeli high tech. Because if you look at what we do in Israel, which is way different than what we do in Silicon Valley, I do believe it's way more about people and way more about people first than it is there. And the final thing I leave you with is, at the end of the day, no one really knows why humans do what they do. And this is the beauty of it. It is our ability to be completely serendipitous beings, to do things that no one else thinks about, to do what we call tagil alba all the time, to change the world in ways that nobody had ever thought about. That's what makes the difference. It can't be predicted. It can't be programmed. It's not an algorithm. It is because we are uniquely human that makes the difference. So, todah I thank you all. Have a great conference.